Hello and a very warm welcome to Bharata First. This is Frank Talk. I'm Frank Rausen Pereira. And since you're here, I would like to thank you for your continued support. For those of you who haven't already subscribed, please like the video, subscribe, hit the bell icon, and then all notifications. Do follow our social media handles for all the latest updates, and you can also subscribe to our newsletter to get some incisive content. The Bharata First team runs a daily big picture quiz. Please do participate by going through the description in big picture videos. Here are the UPI IDs for those of you who would like to come forward and contribute. A small contribution that you make will be a giant leap for us to keep bringing you this content. So do continue to show your love and support. All the information along with a few more recommendations are in the description of this video. So please go through it. Well, I have a very special guest with me on the program today, a man who has put his life on the line serving our motherland, a gentleman whose actions has spoken louder than words and someone who has done us all proud. It is indeed a pleasure to welcome on Frank Talk, author and former chief of India's research and analysis wing or RAW, Mr. Vikram Sood. Mr. Sood, welcome to Bharata First and let me dig into the question right away. So much to ask you, but let me start with a basic question about how do you know what to reveal and what not to reveal? Because you said so much in your books and, you know, with all these interviews that you do, how do you know when you're saying too much or you're saying too little? There's, there's never the right moment that you want to say this, that this is what I should reveal or not. It depends on, on what you're dealing with, actually. If you're dealing with a terrorist situation, if they are doing long-term uh, projections, naturally they will take their time to be assessed and put out or assessments that are given from time to time to the government, intelligence assessments uh, of, you know, of the situation in, in, in Tibet or, or Nepal. So you take, you do your uh, study, you put out a paper and send it to the government as an intelligence assessment. It is it is an input to policy, but it is not policy. Intelligence right. agencies don't make policy. So it's an input to policy. And that's what we are required to do. Then how much to reveal is also a, a matter of judgment on, on the day and how to reveal, whether you want to send it by in a, in a note form or you want to have a one-to-one -one meeting with the person who you want to send the information to. It depends on the sensitivity of the information and the repercussions of its uh, knowledge will have on the functioning of the government or the interests of the government. So uh, we have to decide, but there are, there are certain things that are done in the routine. There are reports that are sent in the routine at a lower level to their counterparts. There are reports sent out as weeklies or monthlies. These are these are routine reports. So there are special reports, routine reports. So what are the Medium. channels that are used, Mr. Sood, to send out these reports? Are there, you know, some SOPs that are to be followed? You know, how do you pass on? Sometimes the information or most of the times the information may be sensitive. And how do you pass this on? No more bureaucratic channels. Right. Uh, written word, classified, exchanged. Uh, that's it. Are there codes that are used? Then not in, in, in the information given to the consumer. No, no. The consumer gets nothing more than just the report. Not the source of information or anything like that. Right. So, is there anything that is hidden in the messages that are, that are sent out? What do you mean by hidden? No, if you have to pass on sensitive information, you know, you're, 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 you're following some, I don't know, some routine procedures and you want to give out some kind of a hidden message to someone whom it's supposed to no, reach we out don't, to. We don't, we don't give hidden messages. It's clear. No, it has to be clear, otherwise it can be misconstrued. Absolutely. Absolutely. How has the game changed, Mr. Sood, over the years? Uh, because, you know, we are in an age of technology now. We are, you know, someone sitting down in the United States can fire a missile in Afghanistan. 
thousands of miles away. So has the game of intelligence gathering also changed? Immensely, immensely changed. I mean, when I started uh, 50 years ago, nearly, it was very simple. You had the wireless as a means of communication. The telex came a little later. And you had the Morse code. That's how you exchange information in the beginning. Telephones, you know, there was no STD, you had to make a trunk call. And uh, that, was, that was hardly secure. But that's, that's how the whole world was. It means to tap your also of that period and the means to communicate were also fairly open. And, uh, so that's the best we had. Your, your, your agents uh, had to rely on these methods to communicate with you as well. So has the game changed and changed differently? Does it make life more difficult for the agents now or does it make it easier? It makes, it makes life uh, quite a lot different for everybody. One is that there is the time time gap was reduced immensely. Secondly, the flow of information is so huge, so massive that you know it's it's an overload. You don't know what is uh, coming out in the open is fake, real, planted, and. It takes a while to understand and sift, and I imagine that's how it would be to understand what's going on, what's real, when when the intelligence agent or the uh, handler, the working person working at the desk gets this information. How does he sift them out and say, this is real, this is not real, this is fake, this is slanted? Slanted, you can make out, you can make out from the origin. I don't expect. A Chinese origin report to be very favorable to us, you know, or the Pakistan. So those those kind of things you have to decide. Uh, I'm not sure it is very easy to doing that now. Besides, uh, the means of communication are so easy, so so quick. The adversary, if the terrorist has access to that kind of facility. He can mask his reports, he can have this end-to-end -end encipher, you're allowed, he can send messages encrypted. So the job of the counterintelligence, the job of the uh, person keeping a watch is also much different, much more difficult. Absolutely. So in a fast-paced world, everything becomes that much more it's difficult. Hectic. It's hectic, yes. It's, it's really hectic. You know, uh, Mr. Sood, the the knowledge of the common man as far as uh, you know intelligence agencies are concerned is very limited and we've seen this world of intelligence gathering from the movies and from the books that we read is it similar is it very different uh, how would you compare the two frank i think uh, one would let the mystique remain it's better like that are there real life J J james bonds not James Bond, but you have real life George Smiley's. James Bond is a fiction. Absolutely. He would never get recruited to MI6 or CIA or RAW. <laughs> <laughs> you know, talking about recruitment, uh, Mr. Sood, uh, do you look at what do you look at in an agent when you recruit someone? Are you talking about an agent or are you talking about a person who's going to handle the agent? Let's 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 look at it both ways. The person who's going to a handler as well as the agent. What what is it that you look at? Well, first of all, you've got to have the right handlers. So is the handler's the, job more difficult then? Since we're here, I'm sorry to cut you short. Is the handler's yeah, job? It's, it's it's much more difficult now than it was ever. It, you see, human intelligence, though vital, is now playing lesser and lesser roles. It seems. When you have so much of tech into artificial intelligence and internet-led material, so 
the information that the human source will give is going to be of a different kind. He's not going to give everything that is already available. That's that's stupid. You don't need uh, topographical maps of any country now. Google gives it to you. You know, it tells you where you are located at any given moment of time if you want that. And he leads you to, to the house that you want to go to. So uh, all that is now different. We used to have to send agents out to target country, equipped with cameras and equipment so that you don't take photograph of the wretched road miles together. Alberts, bridges, etc., etc. And then he would bring back that thing and he would put it together. It could take weeks. The whole process could take months. Now you have it in a flash. You don't need all that. So that's changed. So what is it that you want now? So, you, so yeah, coming back to the question about, you know, what is it that you look at when you recruit both an agent and a handler? What are the, what, what are the qualities? You must have a handler. Who, yeah, I'm talking about the handler, the man who's going to handle the agent. He yes. must know the language, he must know the country, he must have domain expertise, he must have language expertise. And uh, his, uh, apart from his other natural talent, or abilities to handle a human being who is going to be sent out into hostile territory. So there's no there's no yardstick by which you find these. Mm. Fine, we have a system where you have an examination and you recruit them and then they go up the ladder, etc. etc. But in this day and age, you need far more. You need you need language, you need the subject expertise, domain expertise. In a, in a man, one person to have these things to be able to handle agents. There are other linguist experts who will merely do translation, but that's not what you want. And if you are going to send somebody into a hostile country, you have to make sure that he is capable of merging into the background. Right. So he must know the habits, the norms, the customs, the language, the dialect of that target area. Otherwise, he'll stand out. He'll be uh, picked up in no time. So these are, these are uh, some of the essential requirements of recruiting or what you look for when you Apart from his, your concept of that he's, whether he's at a fork or he's going to take risks or he's too, too adventurous, he's going to cause land himself into problems. Those things you have to assess. A couple of aspects that I want to take forward with you, Mr. Sood. You spoke about, you know, whether the person can blend in or not, you know, if he's, if he's going into hostile territory. So what is the kind of training that some of these people really receive before they go into hostile territory? We give him adequate required training. Okay. So adequate training is what they receive and you're only revealing how much you can. But another aspect that I wanted to take forward with you as well, you know, you're talking about blending in and you're talking about, you know, getting into hostile territory. So, uh, you know, as far as being made out or, you know, standing out is concerned, what happens once an agent is identified? They normally try and keep Signaling, signaling method where you know that you've been picked up, you know, writing us, giving us message or something in under duress. There is, you, you teach him how to build it into his uh, reply. A comma, a wrong place, or full stop, wrong place. Things like that you have to evolve but so that you know that what he's saying is he's saying under duress. So another aspect to take forward with, yeah, go ahead, please. Sorry. No, no, it's okay. That's fine. Fine. 
<laughs> double agents is something that we've always read about, something that we've seen in movies and something that always comes up as well. Do they exist? Are you talking about double agents or moles? I mean, moles also is another right. aspect. Yeah, there are two kinds, of course. We can take, we see, can take both forward. A double forward. agent is somebody, a double agent is somebody that you have turned around. He was the enemy's agent, but you've turned him around by letting, letting him work as, a, as still on their rules, as giving up some information that you plant on him to keep his contacts going. But you've turned him around and he's working for you now. That's a double agent. The mole is somebody who's in your organization and you don't know he, he's feeding the other side. All countries have both categories at any given moment in time. You know, there is a mole lurking around somewhere. You what happens? Because you don't know he's there because after he's a trained intelligence officer. So we will cover his tracks. He's in it. Well, what happens to him when he finds out, then it's you should let your imagination run right for a moment and see what might happen. Unless he about... escapes, unless he unless he escapes. Then you've got red faces. Absolutely. But this information hardly ever comes out in the media and elsewhere, Mr. Sooth. So, you know, uh, but what happens is when someone gets caught, you immediately know about it. But those who actually do their job, we never know. Will, no. we ever, will we ever know their stories? You know, uh, the definition of the best spy, the definition is that he does his work brilliantly and is never caught. You never know he was a spy. That's, that's the perfect spy. Philby wasn't a perfect spy. Richard Jorge wasn't a perfect spy. They were very good spies. They have very good information. I mean, this man, uh, this American CIA person and spying for the FBI Russians. person, and they're handsome. They, handsome. they give yes. excellent information to the fabulous spy, but they got caught. So there, that's where the perfection ends. Surfaced. Had they been perfect, they would have continued and retired and gone home. They would not have known. The world would not have known. <laughs> no. How difficult is it so, to operate in enemy territory, Mr. Sooth? Say, for instance, Pakistan. There's a lot that is spoken about Pakistan. And, you know, there's a lot of, uh, of course, we don't really know unless it comes out in the open domain. But the general perception is that India operates out of Pakistan and hostile, operates hostile, quite hostile countries. Hostile countries are normally difficult to operate. Any hostile country, for anybody. And different countries use the different yardsticks to uh, to do their counter surveillance and the, the extent to which they do it. Some make it obvious, some don't make it obvious. Some make it very, some do it very, um, in, a, in a very sophisticated manner. And that's normally the custom in the West. It's very sophisticated. Uh, it's technology oriented. So, that's what they do. It. In, in countries like Pakistan, they make it very obvious that you are under watch. There will be fellow, fellows trailing you all the time. And not unknown to be obnoxious at times. So it's okay. It's part of the game. Is it because they know? They know you're an Indian, full stop. Hmm. They know you're an Indian, so full stop. That's it. Then they pick and choose. Chinese communist countries usually use the restrictive method. They just prevent you from going anywhere, etc. Et Your movements are restricted. 
Your contacts are restricted. The fear of God is put on the other guy. Who wants to meet you? That is the problem. Talking about China, Mr. Sood, you know, uh, we've all heard in media reports and elsewhere that, you know, raw operates out of Pakistan, you know, Nepal and some of the other neighborhood countries. But we don't hear this of China. Is it difficult to operate out of China? And is it difficult for the entire world as well, not just for India, but for others too? China, China is a very difficult country to operate. By the very nature of its state. And uh, restrictions language, people don't, uh, are not very communicative. There, there are problems of different kind in China. You have to work under a lot of restrictions and constraints. Still, you do what you can. Would you say, Mr. Sood, uh, we've been focusing too much on Pakistan of late. Let's move away from the game and look at the bigger narrative because, you know, narratives is something that you've spoken about in your book I, as well. I, I, I personally believe that uh, Pakistan has been the more visible uh, sort of adversary. The real one is China. China is a country which can make a difference to your way of life. And they're doing it day in and day out. They're doing it. They're doing it. And they're doing it very systematically. The way they have penetrated the American system is amazing. And I'm sure they've done it here also. So it's it's not and they must have done it in Pakistan by now. So it's not to be underestimated at all. Pakistan is a problem that you we've learned to handle, as it were, you know. They've, they've tried everything on us, they've thrown everything on us, and it hasn't really made any difference. Yeah, we, we, we had terrorist attacks, we've had casualties, we lost people. But the state by itself has not altered its direction. <laughs> uh, China is going to be a very much more difficult uh, competitor, adversary, neighbor, whatever you want to call it, in the years ahead. And, and uh, as they see us doing better, hopefully we will continue to do that. There will be more and more uh, impediments put in your way. How do we restrict China, take on China, or at least, you know, somewhat slow down the juggernaut? You know, you, you can't put up walls in this day and age. You want to be a democracy, you want to grow so fast, you want to compete with China, you want to prevent China. Where are our priorities? What do we want to be first? We want to be world economy and let's concentrate on that and let's forget everything else. This urge to to be seen as a world power, we need to curb that kind of uh, uh, dialogue among ourselves. Take it easy. You know what Deng said was quite right. Keep a, keep a low profile. Grow first. Grow strong, and then uh, say you are. Then you can emerge. But if you want to say, I'm the world power, and then you can't handle situations, then don't take you seriously. That's a pragmatic approach. That's really yeah. a pragmatic approach to have. Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't look like most many of us are using that approach at all, at, at least at present, in I present guess. times. I, I don't think we are. I'm afraid we are. We're too eager to. Yeah, I'm the greatest. <laughs> you know, Mr. Sud, talking about another aspect, since you're talking about intelligence and intelligence gathering, uh, you know, one of the biggest issues is that there's no synergy between uh, between organizations within the country itself as far as sharing intelligence is concerned. Would you agree with that statement? You, how do we improve the system? I, as, I, as I, don't, I, I really don't know what this uh, means. 
you know, in, in issues like terrorism, there is an obvious overlap. International terror which begins in country A and ends here. When it is happening here, it is actually the baby of the counterintelligence. So the source is there and if we are not able to provide the source of that in, in, in time, then there is a gap. Once it, it is, let's say it is like a like a aeroplane which is crossed over the boundary, then it becomes internal. It is no longer an issue of the external service because they are not supposed to act here. The, the follow-up has to be done here. RW will not be allowed, cannot do, does not have the resources to keep a watch on these characters if they come in here. So, is there a slip up there? Is there sometimes lack of coordination? It can happen. How do we improve but that? I don't think. How do we improve that? <laughs> by, by ensuring that the exchange information. And they, they, they have these uh, multi agency centers and stuff, which I believe are doing pretty well. That's why your success rate at uh, counter terrorism has improved in the last few years <coughs> or decades. So things, things have uh, moved for the better. And uh, let me also say that when you're talking about terrorism, the fact that there is suddenly more activity, more terrorist activity, it does not necessarily mean that terror has increased. It only means that the counter-terror forces are able to engage them more. And when there is silence, it does not mean terrorism has gone. It merely could mean that they are lying low. So they, we don't. You see, if you go by, I'm sorry to say, but if you go by the media expressions, if these are the two yardsticks, then they're all wrong. Your yardstick is has the means to do terror been abolished. There are no cells left, there are no terrorists left, there are no communications, there are no funds coming in. That's when you know that terror is gone, that you've conquered it. But if all these activities are there, then only they're hiding somewhere. Not that terror has been conquered. That's the mistake sometimes we make in assessing and saying, oh, we've, we've done it. You haven't. Next day they'll do it again and show it to you that you haven't. Right. So, yeah. a little modesty is required at times. <laughs> <laughs> Since you're talking about terror, do you believe that um, if we have a global definition of terror and if the world comes to on the same page as far as you know what terror is, things will become a little more easier? <laughs> the world doesn't come to, to any agreement on many major issues. Terrorism is one of them. We haven't been able to define it. Hmm. Your terrorist is my hero. Look, Hamas, for instance, you know, uh, yeah. let's, let's, let's take Hamas as an example because that's quite newsy right now. Some countries declare it as a terrorist organization, others don't. India doesn't recognize it at all. So it's, it's difficult, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, remember when George Bush made that famous statement, global war on terror. And he said, we will all fight it jointly after Al-Qaeda and done 9-11. We all were very thrilled that the Americans are now going to help us. But what George Bush had said was that we will fight all terrorists with global reach. Global reach. Lashkar e Taiba did not, did not have global reach. Daesh e Muhammad did not have global reach. This is a masterly play of words. Taliban did not have. Only Al Qaeda did. Maybe Hezbo Mujahideen, Hezbollah had better reach than 
Sat Nila Shri. So that, that is how you fight terror and you get people on your side. So we thought we'll get help with tackling Lashkara then or not. It won't happen. You go provide information to the Americans on Al Qaeda that is a global war on terror. But then, or they'll give you information on Al Qaeda if you need it. That's it. So uh, you have this play of words, and everybody said, you know, Musharraf has made that statement that Pakistani soil will not be used against Indian India for terror activity. But in their definition, Pak occupied Kashmir is not formally a part of Pakistan. Mm. So they use POK. So this is, going to continue. <laughs> yeah. this is going to continue for a while then because, you know, it's, everyone is looking out for yeah. their own interest. Let's not forget there's a massive arms uh, game in this as well. And that's something that the other countries want to look at too because there's an economic angle through that. Yeah, yeah, it's a... It's a <laughs> it's all a game of money, profits. One has learned to understand how the games are played. Am I audible? You are, you are. I'm listening. It's it's engaging. So you know, not 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 everyone no, speaks I'm so freely. <laughs> not everyone speaks so freely. So it's so it's it's good to hear your views on this. Go on, Mr. Sood. Yeah, so this is something that, yeah, I guess we have to go, come to terms with as common uh, as common citizens because there's a larger game being played and we and it's well above our pay grades. <laughs> so these things will continue to happen. Absolutely. There's not going to be any change. It's probably going to get worse. It is, after all, because we are looking at we are looking at the way weapons are changing. We are looking at biological warfare and so on and so forth. So things are only going to get worse yeah, in the days to exactly. come. Exactly, bio, bio. Is this what is happening in uh, the globe on the globe? Is it a exercise, or is it real? Is it a mistake, or is it deliberate? Now more and more right things are coming out. But yes, it came from Wuhan, from the laboratory. So, uh, what is it that a country wants to do by researching in such things? For the love of it, for searching science, so that you can bring more and more vicious uh, viruses out. What for? Has to be, uh, what is the motive? What is the end game? What is the goal? We just shudder so to think about Is it about something these that you think you can control? Is it something that you can do and hope that it will not affect you? Is the chip thing can go around, come and come back? There is no iron wall against it, there is no iron curtain against it. Absolutely, absolutely. And if you so, look at uh, how the yeah, please so go ahead. So. And if you look at how, if you look at how the narratives have been, have been built around all of this as well. I mean, everyone's been talking about the Wuhan Virology Lab, but the WHO has said its own thing, and you know, there's a very nice narrative that has been yeah, yeah. built around all of this over the last one year. You've written about this in your book as well. So let's talk about narratives for the next uh, couple of minutes or so because that's something that I want to engage with you on as well. Mm -hmm. Hello? So, you know, this issue of narratives, uh, Mr. Sooth, uh, how invested are nations around mm -hmm. the world on building the right kind of narrative and furthering their goals as a result of just building this narrative? I think this is this is a, this is something that the rich and powerful can do. You know, the guy reading, living at the end of the road in his mansion, 
he is by the rest of the crowd down the street is assumed to be this center for all wisdom and success and wealth so he tells by actions you see that he is the person you need to follow his way of life is the best translate into society translate into a nation translate into the globe that's what it is actually building a narrative of superiority and comfort for others to either follow or be beholden that i am superior to you my culture is superior to yours in some countries my religion is superior to yours you know my language all all, all art all philosophy everything had become western it's western civilization what had happened to us the chinese or the persians well, what swept away except ours perhaps now we are trying to find our roots back and if you find your roots back if you get pride in yourself only then you can start to build your narratives well, if only if you understand what what has been happening can you build narrative you can't build narrative by shouting at the top of your voice outside the building i'm the greatest prove it your system has you have to reinvent yourself as it were you are not what what the british told us you were there before them you were there before that you were there for thousands of years so we you've got to come back to that i mean the past is 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 the summer you have to learn from not make it your uh, millstone but live in the past to learn from that to take pride in what your ancestors were at what time that's very long for the same area we got moved out we not migrate we not a the aryan theory absolutely that's all, a very val- valid point given to us given to us and we believed it so we have to tell our own story your way yeah we are a land of great people. people so yeah. do all these things do all these things build your economy build strength then talk about it. build the means of communication how are you going to spread your message we don't have that it's all there in the west we don't have it we have you know it's not going to be easy nobody is going to let you have it just for the asking so let's just make up our mind what we want to be Yeah. You want to be a great nation. You want to be a great economy, a great dictatorship. Choose. Yeah, very rightly said. Very rightly put. Yeah, we are a land of great people. We are a land of uh, great knowledge as well, and that's something that the yeah. British and the others took away from here. If we can get back to our roots and get that out, we will be a powerful nation once yeah. again. I don't know. There is a temple in the south of somewhere. where every four times in a year the sun's rays pass through one window at each equinox top second third fourth once only once Now somebody then had thought of it he built it there were no computers they were no measuring system but they knew how to do it so we have that wealth somewhere hidden and we just let it go it's time to find ourselves you have to find find yourself who are we who are we yeah how we say who are you <laughs> absolutely absolutely wise words coming out of you mr sood i hope all the youngsters who are listening to this can actually feel them and and you know go on a quest of finding themselves 
because that's what's yes. going to change india and that's what's going to change our land our great land yeah coming that's back true. coming back to narratives uh, mr sooth um, the americans have built this beautiful narrative haven't they of being the superpower because they haven't won a war in 75 years yet they are the world's number one superpower yeah that's the power of the narrative great great example that uh, you know really defeated anyone except maybe granada or believe that way they went once but uh, where is so it is how you portray yourself you throw in bollywood hollywood sorry make use of it. you have zero dark 30 you have black hawk down and you have argos now see how great we are and there was a great film i used to we saw when we were kids not kids really college guns of never own guns of never own yeah. you don't know i watched the movie though gregory peck huh? i watched Sorry? the movie though guns of never own yeah you watched the, the movie it's gregory peck david niven and whole lot of other anthony hopkins Top stars of the day. For a long time, they thought it was true. It wasn't. It's just fiction put together like a real movie. There were no guns of never on this. So uh, that's how you tell the narrative. Till today, you have world movies on world war in some form or the other. Why? the nation must know how great we were so and when you had the uh, victory parade in Champs Elysees in 1945 only white soldiers no indian soldiers in the march so you think small thing make it a thing they do they do and the biggest takeaway in my conversation with you today has been about how we need to find our roots how we need to find ourselves and make this country a proud and a better nation and we can do it we have it in us yeah. because our ancestors have done it so why can't we why can't we just have to get to act together absolutely <laughs> stop stop making a noise and actually do something about it <laughs> no just i would say if 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 New York Times is writing whatever it wants to write, Washington Post to write and write, there's no point complaining all the time because that's what they want you to do. They're trolling you, and you 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 react if you want to react, react with facts in your own way in your own writings. Absolutely, don't protest. It's okay. Let them be. There is no need for anybody to. It's 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 a free world. They can write mark if they want to. What can I do? I can stop it. Not that they don't do it to their own people. They do that to them also. So they should accept. That. This is how it is. I'd rather have that than have a closed society. No? Absolutely, absolutely. And at the end of the day, actions so speak to, louder than words. This, this, Yes, this is this is uh, the downside of it. Okay, you're not as bad as living in a close pressure cooker. So let them be. Okay. Once you become powerful and rich, they will sing a different tune. Absolutely. That's it. Absolutely, Mr. Sir. old is indeed gold thank you for the wisdom thank you for the knowledge it has indeed been a pleasure really i have not had such an open conversation with anyone in a while thank you for making my day and thank you for making the viewers day as well i'm sure they would have loved this conversation a pleasure having you on bartha first thank you thank you frank lovely talking to you all the best and before i leave once again I'd like to thank you for your continued support. For those of you who haven't already subscribed, please like the video, subscribe, hit the bell icon and then all notifications. Do follow our social media handles for all the latest updates and you can also subscribe to our newsletter to get some incisive content. 
The Bharata First team runs a daily big picture quiz, so please do participate by going through the description in big picture videos. Here are the UPI IDs for those of you who'd like to come forward and contribute. A small contribution that you make will be a giant leap for us to keep bringing you this content. So do continue to show your love and support. All the information along with a few more recommendations are in the description of this video, so please go through it. That's it from me. See you again next time. Thank you.